Well, thank you, Jonathan and Andrew. Good morning, everyone. It is so great to see everyone right here at the very heart of our university. Thank you again, Jonathan and Andrew, for participating with me and leading our university forward. And thanks to the mighty sound of the Southeast for that rousing music. What a perfect way to start the day. For a, uh, for a few brief moments, even those mighty cicadas took note and stopped their clamoring. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our new marching band director, Dr. Cormac Cannon, and band director, Dr. Scott Weiss, as well as the 370 Gamecock students whose music makes us believe that victories are always possible no matter the score. Let's hear it again for them. Some of our musicians will stick around for a while because I've helped choreograph a new formation that will help me announce our Carolina's Promise campaign final tally later. Don't let that scare anybody away, please. Ladies and gentlemen, as I prepare to share with you some news and plans for the year ahead, I pause to recognize the valued insight of, uh, of those who guide our eight universities across our 14 campuses. Our Board of Trustees, led by Mr. Gene War, the Board of Visitors, including their chair, Mr. Chip Felkel, our Alumni Association Board of Governors, led by President Paula Harper Bethay, and the Carolina faculty, represented today by the chair of the Faculty Senate, Professor Augie Grant. Let's please recognize all of these leaders. And a special greeting from afar to President John Palms and Norma Palms, who called last night to wish us well on this special occasion. I'm delighted as well to be joined by our USC System of Higher Education colleagues, Dr. Susan Elkins, Palmetto College, Dean Walt Collins, USC Lancaster, Dean Mike Sontag, USC Sumter, Dean Alice Taylor Colbert, USC Union, and our new provost and vice president, executive vice president for academic affairs, Joan Gable, who joined us on August 24th. Welcome as well to members of state and local government who are here. Our good Midlands neighbors, representatives of both city and county government are here in this historic setting. And I know that we all have a shared goal of creating an even better Midlands and a greater Palmetto state. Finally, I warmly welcome Patricia Moore-Pastides, who does so much for me and for you as our First Lady, and without whom I wouldn't have the personal support and encouragement to serve so many others. Good morning, Patricia. Friends, one month ago, I began my 17th year at Carolina and my eighth year as president of our beloved university. And together, we've navigated around quite a few impressive roadblocks. But my memory is far more consumed by our many impressive accomplishments. And I don't think that's a trick of memory either. It's because our accomplishments have overwhelmed our challenges. Our resilience and determination, our willingness to innovate and to work hard together, to work together, has cut through the headwinds that crippled or deterred many, many others. And now that we know with certainty that the headwinds won't deter us, we need to accelerate our progress. That's what we plan on doing this year. We're crafting a plan called Carolina 2025, a plan that will take our university into the century's third decade our planning has always been and will continue to be purposeful, not accidental. That's the only way to get to where you want to go and to know when you've gotten there. You'll hear more about Carolina 2025 in the months ahead, but be assured that the major components will focus, as they always have, on the quality of the student experience. And although our student experience is already widely receiving national recognition, 
we can and will continue to look for new methods to help our students like Jonathan and Andrew maximize their experience and reduce their debt. Let me give you an example. Last December, after studying national best practices for advising, we sent out a pair of student surveys. We soon discovered that our own students identified advising as their top priority for institutional improvement. We went straight to work. This past July, under the direction of Dr. Claire Robinson, we opened a new university advising center located on the first floor of the Close Hip Building. It will provide more consistent, accessible, and useful student advising, better than we've ever offered before, and it will provide special attention to freshmen, transfers, and other students in transition. This year, we plan to hire 25 more first-year advisors. They'll help to improve student retention, academic progression, and decrease time to graduation. They'll reduce changing of major, and they'll streamline course selection. And we'll be using data tracking and data analytics to help us. Two years ago, we launched Graduation with Leadership Distinction. To earn this high honor, students must demonstrate extensive, purposeful leadership engagement beyond the classroom. And they have four pathways within which to do that. It's gratifying that our students are embracing this concept, graduating with leadership distinction. To date, 314 students have earned this distinction and I expect this year to see the greatest participation ever. Another key to perfecting a world-class student experience is to continue recruiting and retaining our world-class faculty. I'm grateful to my extraordinary colleagues and the great commitment that each of them brings to our students and to their own scholarship. Our fa faculty continues to accelerate their quest for research funding and last year saw us break our own previous record. Last year, the faculty was awarded nearly a quarter of a billion dollars in sponsored awards, representing a 5.5% increase from 2014. And the economic impact of their activity on our region is estimated to be $630 million in this past year. Please don't think that these increases are a given or a no-brainer. It's not the national norm as universities are struggling to keep pace in the intensely competitive funding environment. Carolina 2025 will call for an expansion of our faculty with the goal of 25 net new professors a year through the next decade, in addition to replacing faculty who retire or resign. These new colleagues will allow us to keep expanding our research base, to continue competing with the best global universities, meet the needs of our growing student body, and better prepare our graduates for the jobs of the future. Faculty salary compression will also be addressed. We've made $1.7 million available for faculty members who, who are identified as deserving salary compression relief and Provost Gable and the deans are working on how to distribute this at present. Joan, in fact, met the high bar that we set when the provost search was launched. She's deeply committed to educational excellence, faculty development, and inclusiveness. She's looking forward, I know, to learning and, cont and contributing her own impact and although she's only been here a short while, her impact is starting to be felt. She'll also be devoted to our top scholars, which is why our Honors College must and will continue to be supported and continue to be highly ranked. You may have seen a recent opinion piece in the New York Times that noted that our Honors College, the South Carolina Honors College, was a comparable alternative to the Ivy League and a better bargain for families. From Honors College to Capstone, Fulbright, Goldwater, 
Holling scholars, and many more, our students are excelling and taking advantage of what we offer. Magellan scholar Lily Gullion is a perfect example. Lily has a passion for helping children with disabilities. This passion took her uh, as an exercise, exercise science major to the Netherlands over the summer, where she collaborated with professors to refine computer games created by Carolina exercise science professor Roger Newman Norland. Lily reports that the games are promising and useful tools for therapists who work with children with autism spectrum disorder. What I love about her story is how she leveraged so many resources, including crowdfunding, a partnership with the Office of Research, and Experiment.com to make her Netherlands experience possible. And she told us, quote, and Lily's here, she said, I couldn't understand how such a huge school could foster student-faculty interactions. However, the faculty and staff have done an excellent job in providing me with a personalized experience, and USC has given me an incredible support system. Thank you, Lily. That's a great story, and a story not unlike many standout stories that we hear all the time. Speaking of standouts, we have 47 nationally ranked academic programs, more than any other university in the state, including, of course, our number one undergraduate and number one graduate, uh, graduate international business program, as well as very high rankings in exercise science, engineering, public health, nursing, hospitality, criminology, and others. And two standout initiatives that are serving our students well across the state and that gained a lot of national attention last year are Palmetto College, and on your time graduation. Since the 2013 launch of Palmetto College, 1,452 students have been enrolled in one of seven online baccalaureate completion programs. And of those, 385 have already gained their bachelor's degree. And more than 10,000 seats have been filled in 320 unique online courses. Most of these new graduates told us that they would not have received a baccalaureate degree, gotten a raise, or improved their lives without Palmetto College. On Your Time graduation in its third year is also in full flight. As you know, On Your Time is our commitment to timely graduation and reducing student debt. We've re-engineered the academic calendar so that we now teach 12 months a year. Now students don't have to take an annual summer sabbatical, although they'd like too many of them, I know. Instead, they can accelerate their path to graduation, saving time, saving money, and getting a jump on their careers. The feedback from students is incredibly positive. We know that because this past summer, they enrolled in over 600 courses, 600 summer courses right here in Columbia, including 43 common core courses. We also know that 19,737 classroom seats were filled right here during the summer, substantially beating the numbers from the year before. And as, and as a result of extensive lobbying led by USC, students were for the first time able to use their lottery scholarship for summer attendance. I applaud the General Assembly for financially supporting Palmetto College and On Your Time. They both bring a new flexibility and a new reality to the college experience of South Carolinians. And those programs are both making waves nationally, and we're contemplating even more. We're also making sure that our student athletes have the opportunity to excel both on and off the field. My role as chairman of the Division I board of the NCAA has placed me in a front, in a front seat position 
in the national conversation about the future of intercollegiate competition. I believe strongly that it's important to preserve the amateur model that we love so much, and we, but at the same time, we can and should provide to the financial well-being, to the health monitoring, career counseling, and financial, overall financial well-being of our student athletes. Games, Gamecock students this fall are receiving an extra stipend to cover legitimate expenses not formerly allowed by the NCAA. These expenses cover things like traveling home, food outside the meal plan, gas, and other sundries. Led by Ray Tanner, Charles Waddell, Judy Van Horn, and Fran Person, USC has moved to the national forefront by creating and launching what we call the Gamecock Student Athlete Promise, a championship experience. And universities all over the nation are now joining us by also expanding the benefits that they offer to student athletes. Friends, throughout our system, we serve more than 48,000 students. And when our campuses work together as a collective and cohesive whole, there is so much greater power in what we can do. The old adage is true that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. With that in mind, Mary Ann Fitzpatrick has assumed the new position of Vice President for System Planning, and she's already working to improve the quality, coordination, effectiveness, and long-range planning for the whole system. Our three comprehensive universities beyond Columbia are thriving. All of them have bucked a national downward trend in enrollment. All of them have the highest enrollment in their own university's history. In addition, the quality of what they do is evident everywhere. USC Aiken was just recently this week again ranked as the top public baccalaureate college in the South. That's the 11th time that they've had that recognition. And USC Upstate and USC Beaufort were also in the top 10 again. Of particular note is USC Aiken's P Pacer Pathway Program, a one-year residential program offered jointly by USC Aiken and USC Union. Note the collaboration there. And the pathway provides first-year students affordability, access, and academic support from both institutions with the opportunity to enroll fully as sophomores at USC Aiken. USC Beaufort, with its two very distinctive campuses in the Carolina Sea Island communities, if you've never been there, you have to go visit. We welcome there a new chancellor, Dr. Al Panu, who's an accomplished academic leader. I also would highlight USC Beaufort's Sand Shark Scholars Program. I wonder if our Gamecock students are intimidated by the Sand Sharks Scholar Program. They shouldn't be. It's much like the Pacer Pathway and the Gamecock uh, Gateway Program. Sand Shark Scholars offer a successful collaboration between USC Beaufort and USC Salkahatchee. Again, note the collaboration, allowing students to make progress in their intended major during their freshman year while preparing to enroll in USC B at the start of their sophomore year. And at USC Upstate, the Child Advocacy Studies Program, the only one of its kind in the state, will be opening its Child Protection Training Center at the George Dean Johnson Jr. College of Business and Economics in downtown Spartanburg. And last year, USC Upstate received a $2.2 million grant from the US Department of Education designed to increase student success and improve graduation rates. Indeed, the University for South Carolina is a vital part in every corner of this state. And we're so proud as well of our universities in Allendale and Walterboro and Lancaster and Sumter and Union. 
Ladies and gentlemen, as you know from having been here this past summer, our Columbia campus has been in a state of construction and renovation, but the work of all of the architects and masons and carpenters and painters assures us that our buildings and classrooms will support an even better student learning environment. This morning, many of our Columbia students, I know all of them would have been here if they could, but many of them are in classes in the new Darla Moore School of Business, in the College of Information and Communications, and the new College of Social Work over in Hamilton. Rutledge, Legree, and Pinckney are all in the midst of renovation. 650 Lincoln, the newest public-private student housing complex, is buzzing with activity, and numerous other private student housing projects are underway. Carolina 2025 calls for the strategic initiation of 530,000 gross square feet of repurposed academic space that will enable us to continue to meet the needs of a larger undergraduate student body. The space in the close hip complex and in the current School of Law, which will be vacated as we know in 2017 when the impressive new School of Law complex is completed, will increase the number of undergraduate classrooms and instructional laboratories significantly. Friends of South Carolina's only Carnegie top tier research university, we have a profound economic impact of $4.1 billion annually on the Midlands and the state of South Carolina. I'm also proud of our status as one of only 40 public universities in the entire country to hold both the Carnegie top tier designation in research and in community engagement. Our Office of Economic Engagement, led by Bill Kirkland, has facilitated several important new public-private partnerships that promise to give us all and our state a competitive edge as we serve higher education in our state and beyond. And we plan on developing more of them. For example, our IBM Center for Applied Innovation is being recognized as the place where experts from the university and IBM work together to provide IT application services to the public and private sector. They focus on big data and data analytics. Once construction is completed, the center, which also houses technicians from the Floor Corporation, will move to its new home on the corner of Blossom and Assembly in the InnoVista Research District. And in August, we marked the first formal partnership between the Boeing Corporation and the university's McNair Center, South Carolina's first university-based aerospace research center. Boeing provided $5 million in funding for research projects to create the next generation of aerospace technology and to improve their existing products. In the future, later this fall, I'll be announcing a new initiative in cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is absolutely vital because our nation must provide better security within the digital world in which we live. It's part, in fact, of our own national security and our personal security. Our university has the expertise to work with the private sector and with other state universities to help us face the digital future with greater confidence, and we'll have more to say about this in the fall. And we're also planning an institute to help improve K through 12 teacher and principal training especially in the rural parts of the state. USC simply cannot stand on the sidelines while our educational needs are so profound. And we won't stand on the sidelines either as national conversations about social, health, and public policy issues continue to fracture and fray. I remain intent on fostering a community of scholars that understands the value of civility and the importance of service leadership. 
in the wake of Charleston's overwhelmingly tragic, uh, great uh, tragic situation this past summer, there seemed to be a rich abundance of unity in brotherhood and sisterhood that emerged. Indeed, I was extremely proud and am extremely proud to be a South Carolinian as we saw how the people of our state responded to that unimaginable, unimaginable heartbreak. John Dozier, our chief diversity officer and other community leaders are planning a series of dialogues, bringing town and gown spirit and honest conversation to that effort. A university is a perfect place for honest conversation and debate. Conversation that doesn't always lead to a concrete resolution, but one that advances a respectful tenor and creates a more tightly woven community. One that is resilient in time of crisis and, and more embracing of change when change arrives. I will, of course, continue to advocate for increased state funding of our university. We owe this to each family that scrimps and saves and does without other things so their son or daughter can attend Carolina. The university's board of trustees and I are extremely sensitive to the burden of debt. And this year, I feel optimistic about our common cause with the General Assembly to address our funding situation with creativity and resolve. We'll call on all public universities to work with us and together suggest a path that leads to a strong handshake with state government. We'll bring leadership, flexibility, and the spirit of compromise in the name of lim limiting and reducing student debt and I'll work closely with Jonathan and Andrew, the Board of Trustees, the Board of Visitors, at My Carolina Alumni Association as we move ahead. Let's hope that next year we'll be celebrating here at this time with government leaders uh, the path forward that we found together. And with your indulgence, I'd like to now celebrate with you something that very few universities have ever done raised over a billion dollars within a defined period to support the many deserving needs of our students and our faculty. Finding that support was Carolina's promise. Friends, we started that campaign in a moment of duress as tough financial times began to roil higher education and the nation. I remember eyebrows being raised when we contemplated and then announced that goal. Audacious, it was called. Ambitious, I agree that it was. I also remember our campaign consultant reminding us that South Carolina was not an affluent state, that no other organization in the state had ever attempted or done this, and that many of our alumni who wanted to help were very young. But I also knew that we had a great case to make, that we could pull together a great campaign committee, that non-alumni would contribute along with alumni, and that everybody wants to be on a winning team. And today I'm happy, make that ecstatic, to announce our campaign's final number a number that indeed starts with a capital B. I've asked some of them.
Thank you all. That's what you get when you get a president doing choreography. <laughs> Let's thank these wonderful students once again. Thank you. I'd like to thank our campaign chairman, David Seaton, Jancy Hauk, Michelle Dodenhoff, and our entire development team. And let me also say a great thank you to the entire Carolina family, including students, alumni, faculty, staff, and as I said before, other friends who were not heretofore connected with Carolina. But all of them were there with us. All of them helped take us over the top. There were 136,850 generous donors, in fact, who took us over the top. Each of you has made this possible, and in making it possible, each of you has made a significant difference in the lives of our students. This isn't the end of the campaign, it's the beginning of a better future. So as I close, I readily admit that I have much to be thankful for. I'm privileged to help lead the best university in the world. That's according to my own personal ranking system. <laughs> I have the energy that this year will demand of me, and I think that the likelihood that next year I'll be able to give an equally hopeful and optimistic state of the university address is actually quite high. It's a particular honor to be in the company of this young generation. It's only because they have no limits that the university also has no limits. Of course, we have tons of work to do between now and then. I'm looking forward to our first home football game this Saturday and to a very exciting uh, season of sports and lectures and arts performances and so many other activities. I hope to see you tailgating at Gamecock Park or at the opening of the My Carolina Alumni Center in the Vista or right here on the Horseshoe, my very favorite place of all. Have a wonderful year, everyone. Thank you for attending the State of the University, and go Gamecocks. Thank you, everyone. Before you leave, before you leave, I'd like to invite, uh, invite a wonderful singing group of Carolina students called Mayberry. They'll lead us in singing the alma mater. So if you would stand now, please do that.